Welcome back. Is everyone staying awake after lunch? For our next presentation, we have Fabian speaking about content caching. Thanks, Fabian. I think I will use the microphone on the other one. Um, yeah, so I choose a, a title with a lot of buzzword to expect to have a lot of people. And the room is not full, so I should have uh, selected another topic maybe. Um, the, first, uh, the first slide will probably be about myself, so probably some people in the room know me already, or people not knowing me. Uh, my name is Fabio Rotin, I'm supposed to be a local guy, a local guy. Uh, I like to say, well, some, some title change, uh, what season uh, means, some people call them uh, DevOps, DevOps, whatever. I like to, to introduce myself as a DevOps practitioner, meaning that I like to keep breaking things in loop, and I have a communication loop with myself, learning how I can enhance the way I break things and fix the new project. Um, joke aside, we'll try to speak about caching content. So, the first question we should ask before answering the question is why do you want to cache content uh, at home? in your small environment network, in your data center, whatever. The first reason is speed, probably. Um, who is old enough to have, to have uh, played with dialogue connection in the past? Please raise the hand. Good, some people are using P90 models, probably. Those are the good old days. So we have now better network connectivity. We have high-speed connectivity. But if you look at the graph, maybe you were at the time when you were using a simple dialogue connection, you were managing one or two nodes. Now you have a bigger pipe connected to the internet, but you have probably a thousand or hundred or thousand of nodes to manage behind you. So we still have the same problem, that speed is an issue. The network itself can be unreliable, especially if you want to get content from the internet itself. And to be frank, there is no need to use, abuse, or load your uh, internet connection, right? So what I will cover in the talk is really basic for some of you. And I thought initially that no, that's probably too simple. I will not talk about those simple things we can do. But you would be surprised that in 2018, some big companies don't still use the simple thing I will show you. A fun fact, uh, two weeks ago, I discovered that our middle of this machine were um, really <coughs> under on heavy load because of one company is just relying on our middle CDN to get their package from us for a lot of machines. If you are interested into the um, deep dive session, because we have to tune the NF contractable at the kernel level, I wrote a blog post about that. But that's interesting that it gives me a strong point, a strong point to the discussion here. Some people don't know it, or some people are just coming to Linux. Um, earlier, uh, to, earlier today, some people were discussing about how can I just deploy a machine with PC, etc. Right? So, some people are coming uh, new to Linux and have to learn how to do things. So just a small disclaimer, um, what I will present here is probably not the best way to do things, but I will explain the constraint that we have regarding the CI.centos.org uh, environment that we provide to the special interest group when they want to test um, the, um, the package, whatever. So you can try to reduce some of those techniques, your uh, may vary, so it's up to you. So then the next question is, what do you want to cache? Well, if you ask me the same question five or six years ago, I would have said only Erbium packages, right? We are talking about center distribution or Fedora or whatever, so it's about artifact, but artifact being Erbium packages. But I, I don't get it. Some people told me about two times already during the day about something new called containers. I don't know it. I should probably have a look at that. But that's also something that you will probably to cache somehow in your deployment system. So we'll cover how you can do that. But you have also other artifacts that you can also cache to speed the way you want to retrieve and install and deploy those. So. And in your build environment, for example, if you just build containers or build Erbium packages, you can cache your build route so that you don't have to provision the build route every time. Um, you can 
P dependent on one, and if you just store that not on this version of TempFS or whatever. So we have plenty of way to do that. We will cover also a small enhancement called TLS, which certainly is interesting because it can break the way you would do caching like you would do in the past. Mm -hmm. So first thing that uh, comes to mind is proxies. We mentioned data connection or ISDN connection on the past, so maybe the only way to get access to internet was to go through a proxy. So there are plenty of proxy solutions that you can use to cache content, because proxy is not only about tunneling systems, tunneling your call to internet, but also to cache uh, that. So one of the most known solutions is, of course, uh, Squid, which is the most available uh, proxies in place to do some caching. You can also do caching in front end of your machine, like a uh, simple thing like Nginx. Can do, um, you can specify the proxy cache pass to say, oh, everything's static on the proxy level, at the Nginx level will be there for, for example, one hour, and I don't want to hit the, the backend load. So you can also cache there. Um, in your application, like I was mentioning something like uh, building through Mock, Mock can also use a proxy, so that's one of the possibilities. But proxies are not always a good solution those days. Why? I mentioned TLS. What is the problem you can have as soon as you want to get content from a TLS server, so HTTPS server? Then the, the connection is encrypted, so nothing will be ever cached at all. Those days, HTTP proxies are no longer useful. Most of the traffic is encrypted, and though they just add as a dump intermediary, uh, intermediary during, uh, between your node and the remote server from which you want to, to get content. So they are just man in the middle passing traffic, traffic through, but you don't get any caching effect from the proxy anymore. So let's have a look at the CentOS CI requirements. So Kibi, if you were at the, since the beginning, at the beginning of the, the day, Kibi mentioned uh, the CI and CentOS environment that we have. Um, we provide bare metal machine for every project. So we have a Jenkins there, we have some uh, API that we provide, and at the back of, the, uh, of this, it's just instead play with the project <coughs> machine in loop. So um, we had to have everything available there so that we, st we speed up the, the deployment, of course. So it's fresh install, bare metal, uh, we just use Kickstart deployment, so nothing fancy, everybody knows Kickstart probably in the room. So we just use the at core group, so really the minimal version of CentOS. But we don't have any configuration management system installed on the node. Because those nodes are just ephemeral, we just install, test, reinstall machine loop. So Brian uh, gave some uh, metrics about it. We, uh, we are roughly around 500,000 reinstall in that environment of biometric machine for CI that's into the world. So we just have to keep in mind that we don't touch the machine once it is provisioned. So we have to be as close as possible as what you would get from a default CentOS install that you would do from DVD or even from the network. Just plenty, uh, just plain CentOS. So we have to do caching in a different way. Because the normal way of doing things when you want to deploy CentOS in your environment is, well, you just want to set up an internal mirror, of course. You want to use, um, um, you want to fetch from one of the mirror, public mirror that offer Ersync. You Ersync every, the, the whole content internally. And you use your configuration management um, that can even be bash script if you want, we don't care. Just to supply your own .repo file for the YAM so that it points to your mirror instead of mirror list. So that's, that's easy. That would be the normal way of doing things. But that's not what we do. So setting up an internal memory is really easy because um, the whole CentOS 3, so at the moment we support 6 and 7, is 100 gig, uh, 130 gig. So that's not a big deal, right? And if you want to add alternate ARC support, so ARM HFP, ARM64, PP64, and PPC64 LE, that just adds something like 85 gig on top of it. So that's not even 250 gigs of disk space for an internal mirror. If you can't afford 250 gig space on a machine internally, I think that you have other problems to solve than your deployment, right? 
So they have multiple ways of doing things like that, but you keep an internal on your own and you can scale. Um, I will not discuss in detail, but if you some some of you were probably last last week at DevConf in Bono, a guy from Facebook, uh, David Cavada, was explaining the, the video is on YouTube how Facebook use centers on every every machine they have and how they use the caching. So they have some kind of uh, your repository into a mirror, but they still have a varnish cache solution in front of each cluster. But of course, you don't have to use that, as, especially if you are not Facebook or Google. Uh, so just keep that in mind and keep it stupid and simple. So that would be the normal way of doing things. But I say that from a central CI environment perspective, we don't touch the configuration. It has to be the normal CentOS version that you would have with, if you install it manually. So we have to be intrusive and redirect transparently the, the request to the mirror that we have internally there. So at the high level, what is the first thing that yum update would do on the machine when you just hit yum update in a shell? First thing would be? Sorry? Pretty config file. Config file. And the default config file does what? Look for the fastest mirror. <coughs> Sorry? Look for the fastest mirror. Yeah, so first, in fact, it can, well, before contacting the mirror list, it does DNS request. And I know that Chris is in the room, so everything is a freaking DNS problem. So we have a way to be intrusive through DNS. So that's the first thing that Yum does. Uh, a or AA record, or triple, uh, for a, 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 a record for mirror list that's into the road. It contacts one of those machines, we have four machines for that. The machine that uh, knows from where you are coming, so it does dual IP stuff, and it sends you a list of validate mirror for your country or nearby, nearby country. Then your, the young process on your machine select one of the fastest uh, mirror <coughs> from that list and then contact the mirror and then you fetch content. Uh, and, and then you enjoy your solar installation. So back to the process. We want to be intrusive without touching the machine. So we just need to um, set up a VOS on the upside that would mimic what mirrorless.centosoro do. And it's, it's really simple. And we just have also to uh, redirect to that mirror, uh, mirrorless node. And we will use DNS overrides for that. How can you do that? Well, for the, the, the virtual host in Apache, that's really, really, that's really the minimal version. I usually don't like to put code in slides, but in case some people would like to read that afterwards, um, that's really the, the stripped down version of it. But with five lines of PHP code, that's what you would use just to put it transparently to your mirror. In that case, I use mirror that's into the rogue. I will explain why, but can be my beautiful mirror dot my domain dot com, whatever, right? So that's easy. But the first thing to do is redirect the DNS request itself. So how can we do that? Um, there are multiple ways to do that. So depending on your environment, if you're working on your laptop. Uh, and you have plugged in some VM to a network, you know that the default uh, DHCP and DNS uh, resolver that your, your network machine will get is, get, uh, is obtained through DNS mask. You have the DNS mask process on the machine. So that's easy, you just add whatever, you just have a few on the machine, and that's it. All your VM will automatically be consuming that and be contacting your fake, let's say fake, uh, mirror list <coughs> at the center of the local machine. <coughs> so, um, DNS mask is good, you can also use that for a very small network, but it has its own set of problems because it's really simple, but it doesn't do caching, doesn't update correctly all the time to leave. Uh, it's not really a resolver, so it's just a kind of DNS helper, but not really a resolver. So the option that we use within Sandas for quite some time is Unbound. So they are as many as uh, DNS solution and, and resolver solution in Linux then, yeah, colors in the, in the rainbow. So uh, Unbound is a nice solution that I like to use for that because it has some really cool stuff for caching uh, and you can use that as a caching, um, web, uh, caching server internally. 
and uh, it has some cool, interesting feature in the sense that instead of loading, because you don't want to suddenly be autoritative in your environment for the one center of the log zone, just to redirect one click on, right? You still want to rely on us for everything else, for the website, for the mailing list, for the forums, for whatever. You just want to have one specific code redirected to your version of your list. So, anybody can let you do that through a simple file that you can drop, and configuration management can do that, uh, in a simple file, and you are just preloading cache those records. So I, I'm just loading the air code and the PTR. Uh, oh well, oh, I don't have the PTR example here, but that's, that's the ID. Meaning that from a central CI environment, the machine is installed, contact the unknown resolver that we have there, that itself used the classical for water, and notice that Transparently, it has to contact that machine, that internal machine for the list, and not the official one that we run to the US and to you in, uh, in Europe. So, Unbound is really great for that. Um, I admit that I'm, I have looked uh, at Unbound and we use that for multiple projects, not only CI, but multiple projects in the Citadel Infra. Um, but some people would still like to use Bind. So initially, Bind didn't support those options, but now it does. So if you still want to use Bind for that, there is a new um, feature called Response Policy Zone. If you don't know, you can just um, Google for it, Response Policy Zone, but it's exactly what I, I'm, I was doing with um, Unbound. You just have some specific record, not a wall zone, but specific record that you want to preload in cache. And you instruct named, so bind, that I have a specific zone for which I will just preload and I will serve everything from my cache and not from the upstream and the automated um, server. That's a good way also to avoid spam or uh, ads advertising website. You can preload some web, some some responsibility zone file from internet by the way if you don't if you don't know it. So you can do that. But you can also have used that technique to transparently redirect uh, the traffic to your own mirrorless machine that itself would just provide a link to uh, mirror.centre.org. The reason why I mentioned mirror.centre.org instead of my beautiful mirror.ci.centre.org is that, remember from alternate architecture, if you have looked at ARM64 and PPC64 LE, for example, we don't provide in the default install a mirror list, but just a base URL, because the external mirror didn't want to suddenly be able to carry the alternate architecture. So I still need to transparently redirect mirror.center.org to my internal machine within the CI environment so that all the architecture are covered with just simple lines. So that's the way you would do it for RPM packages in a simple way. Um, we can do that because mirrorless doesn't go over TLS. So we also provide other internal mirror within CI like Apple. We have an official Apple mirror. So the mirror management, the mirror manager uh, website from Federal knows that we have one for Apple internally because a lot of projects rely on Apple packages for the CI testing. So we had some problem at the bandwidth level. So we had to also have an internal mirror for Apple. Everything was good. And we enjoyed that for since I think that we started the CI project in 2004. 15 very well. But slowly we started to see some people getting outside for other reasons. Reason are containers. So it's only a new kid on the block that appears and we have also to deal about how we can do caching for containers. I don't know if some of you are already using containers in development or production. One guy, two, oh, that's a new high. Three, four, oh, okay. So, you should ask who's happy using them. Probably not happy, but that's a... <laughs> yeah, so I'm not, yeah, don't get me started with a container, Chris, but... <laughs> container itself is nothing more than a new way of delivering packages. When you think about it, what is an OPM packages? What is an OPM package? It's just a CPU archive with some metadata so that it can know how to extract the CPI archive and it does the change like everything and some, some scripts. What is a VPN package? Same thing, it's just an archive, 
So with AppAir, you can extract the, the package and you have data about the gist inside of the, the data package that you can extract. So it's always the same thing. Containers are nothing but the same thing again. Um, to understand how we can do caching with uh, container and registry, you have to think about the fact that the registry itself is providing you some metadata again, providing you some, some key value um, parameters, that's right, and some checksum. So basically, SHA 256 checksum. But the content that you will get, the blob itself, is nothing more than, in fact, the dot archive, wrapped some, somehow with some specification. Oh, JSON, tar archive, you're good to go. Yeah, yeah. So it's still an archive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and the way we do with container is you have a base image, and then you have layer content because the, in the metadata it knows that uh, that one is another one. But still, at the end of the day, it's just something you want to download and explode. So, you, we had a question about how, what, how can we speed up uh, container installation from, at that time, the most used uh, registry, which is Docker Hub. So people would ask, how can we just speed up uh, container installation from Docker Hub from within the CI environment, to not always, for every CI job, go to uh, Docker, uh, docker.io, fetch content, etc. So I just had a look at uh, the way um, to do that. And there is a small package that I realize not a lot of people are aware called Docker Distribution. So a lot of people knowing Docker Distribution knows that it's a simple way of having your own Docker registry on your laptop, for example, or in your small environment. But it has some other cool feature from the Docker D um, that lets you uh, that lets you uh, specify a proxy. And you can redirect all the code to your local registry or your registry setup to the upstream one, being the one from Docker.io, which is the official name, so registry-1.docker.io. Right? What it will do is that as soon as you uh, do a Docker pool from that registry, it will automatically get it for you and it will cache on that one. So the, sec the second time that someone is asking for the same checksum, the same layer contents, it will get it from your uh, proxy doing caching and not from Docker.io. That, that seems to be beautiful, but we have to instruct the Docker daemon that it suddenly has to fetch it from someone else and not from Docker.io. So, Docker D knows that uh, it has an option for that. That's called dash dash registry uh, mirror, blah blah blah, blah etc. So the way you would do it from a Docker daemon perspective on your machine version is just uh, you can you have the add registry option when you want to point to your registry, but if you just say registry mirror option, suddenly it knows that it has to do two things. It still talks to the upstream, the authoritative Docker.io um, registry for the index, so index dash one, the Docker.io, you will get it. And then you will, tell, you will, you will try to um, get the, the image set the blobs from your internal mirror and not from the upstream one. So that's a simple way to automatically um, feed your internal registry with the container coming from Docker.io. Um, when I tested that, I said, oh, that's cool. Now I, I have a solution back. And I came back to some people in, on the CI user, they say, that's fine. Th here's a simple thing you can do just to speed up your testing in the CI environment. But we have another problem. We try to be as transparent as possible. But then I have to instruct people that, oh, if you run your test in CI environment, you have to do that, those extra steps to be sure that you're pulling from the internal registry and not from outside. But if you want to run the same test outside, you have to inject logic in your test. So, oh, am I running in the CI environment or not? So I'm not really transparent. So they came back and said, well, don't you have something more transparent? Yes and no. Um, remember the TLS problem? For Docker Dio, everything happens through TLS. So it's always HTTPS that is used as the transport for the index itself, 
uh, but also for registry dash one. So I came back with a solution saying, here is a potential solution, but I don't like it, and I will explain you why. I call that the unethical way, because we want to be intrusive, but in a bad sense. Um, I hope that people can read that disclaimer, and can you repeat? <laughs> Playing man and man is bad, really, really bad. So I will continue as long as you don't repeat after me. Playing man and man is really, really bad. Thank you, Bill. So, so what I, what's shown here is just shown for academic reasons, so that you know exactly how you would do it. But there is a problem of trust. So it's up to you to decide if you trust your own environment or not. And how you want to, well, it's CI, right? So it's this kind of a machine. But, so, but it's still an ethical problem more than a technical one. So how you can do that? We try to suddenly become registry <coughs> dash one of the curve model. That means that I just have to expose on my Docker distribution, internal mirror, a TLS certificate that claims M I am of registry dash one the girl IO. And you can generate that easily. But then you suddenly have something to do uh, at the client side, I will show you. So same thing for the TLS override that we use for the um, RPM mirror. We just try to redirect to our mirror automatically. Registry dash one the IO is in fact the machine internally at CI. But we have another problem. How does that work with the TLS certificate? What do we have to do? Signed by CA that's accepted by the system. Yeah, of course. And I don't think that I would try to come with an official CA that can you sign something that, I, that claims that I will register that one with the current IO? No. Uh, and that's bad. But within, C, within the CentOS, we have our own CA that we already use for uh, our own instance of FAST for the uh, accounts.centos.org. We also uh, we have uh, plenty of certificates that are uh, floating around. Like if you build in CDS, uh, you have already uh, X509 certificates. All the communication between the, 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 the builder up and over uh, TLS and uh, certificates coming from the command CA. So what if I can just use my own CA that we trust already for something to become a bad certificate? <laughs> so, well, that's just the, 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 the simple Apache front end that you can put on top of your Docker distribution. So nothing fancy, that's really the, ver the minimal version. So the registry uh, certificate and key I will use, uh, that's the, the one from my CA and some just errors so that Docker is really happy with that, and you just proxy pass to uh, Docker distribution, which itself will use, remember, proxy, uh, registry dash one dot um, uh, Docker IO. Um, please, again, disclaimer, this is bad, really, really bad, just shown for the proposes on it, right. So, what we still have to do is, it's not as transparent as it should, because we still have to somehow Make sense us defaulting, well, trusting the, the certificate authority that signed for just for the uh, registry dash, dash one not the I certificate. So, and you can trust me, it's not in the default centos based <laughs> install. That would be really, really bad. But because we just use Kickstart, I came back with a solution that I have a proposal, but I don't really like it. But if you really want that to be transparent, what we can do is at the Kickstart level, it's in the CI environment. We can just inject the CA certificate that we are using. So that technique is bad for some other thing, but that is a technique I used for a previous job where we were, for uh, official reason, using our own CA that we had to trust it by default. So from that point, that's really easy. You just uh, have your certificate that you put on the local path, on the on each machine, and you just update the CA trust. And from that time on, every communication with a certificate exposed and signed by that CA is going to be trusted and no error, no warning, nothing. That means that if you just do that and you just do the, the, the paper step, Docker pool without modification will automatically get it from registry dash one IO, which is the, your own internal copy and proxy doing caching, but the content will come somehow from the upstream one with the benefit of doing caching at the local side. But once again, this is bad. So, this is already the last slide. Question and maybe answer depending on the question. 
comment. Um, so Fedora, it's not so much of a question, but just a, a comment observation. In Fedora's infrastructure, the service uh, codepackages.fedoraproject.org it provides access to all the build contents in the build system. And that's a, it used to run on top of a squid cache that cached all the packages so we could keep everything in RAM. And we had the correct certificate so we could proxy things properly and not have to worry about um, TLS and SSL. Um, but we switched that recently to Varnish and it seems to perform a lot better and caches things really well. I've also used instances of like SNI proxy to deal with TLS in other ways, but, um, and then we've also had in Fedora the SC90 build system is in a completely different physical location, so we use the same concepts with the squid cache to cache things locally close to the builders to, you know, not fill the, the big links. Um, but, uh, just a comment that it kind of fits into this a little bit. That's um, it's an example where uh, all the Ansible playbooks for Fedora's infrastructure are available, so you can go and see how they've done that if you wanted to play around and do it. Thank you. No comments or questions? If so, thank you.